Hello everyone, can you all hear me? Fantastic, um, my name's Phoebe and uh, this is my colleague Ellie. Um, we are, I, I work for a heritage consultancy and Ellie works for a Cambridge Archaeological, is it Trust? Yeah. Unit, Cambridge Archaeological yeah. Unit. Um, so we are basically just big um, QGIS nerds. And the whole point of us wanting to run this session today, not only because CIFA put out a call for uh, skills related sessions, but because we both believe very vehemently that GIS is a really fantastic skill for archaeologists and it's a skill that isn't necessarily taught or offered enough in our industry. So we're really glad to be able to be here today to hopefully get some people interested in it and get some people learning it and get some people finding it much less intimidating because I know that a lot of people especially those who have done it maybe archaeology undergrads or masters might have touched on GIS in various forms but it's definitely a different beast and uh, it can be quite daunting so hopefully we'll lift the veil today and actually see that it's a really interesting fun useful and easy tool to use when you really get onto it so I'm going to give you a little bit of a presentation to begin with about what GIS is, its background, its applications in archaeology, and then I'm going to talk to you about mapping. And I'm expecting to see a lot of faces glaze over when that comes, because it's, you know, you're archaeologists, you're not cartographers, but um, it, it is actually quite cool and quite interesting, and it's really useful as a piece of foundational knowledge upon which to base your, the rest of your mapping skill. So um, don't worry if you get to the mapping bit and you're like, right, that's it, why am I here? You don't use it as much as you think, but it's good to know about and it's interesting to talk about. So that's why it's in there. And also we had three hours to fill. So, you know, um, got to do that. So, yeah, apologies. There's no lecterns. I'm going to be going backwards and forwards to you. So if you can't hear me, do let me know. So simply defined, um, GIS is a framework for gathering, managing and analysing data. It provides a way to create, manage, visualise, analyse and interpret geospatial data. So from an archaeological perspective, GIS helps us understand what has happened. For example, the spatial, the spatial distribution of an archaeological site. What is happening? So, for example, uh, tracking the rate of sediment coverage on a wreck. And maybe what will happen? So, for example, modelling coastline change. So all of these are key aspects of um, archaeological investigation and as you can see already there's some fantastic applications for this wonderful tool. So a GIS consists of digital data, so the geographical information that you'll view and analyse using computer hardware and software. Then on top of that you've got to have the computer hardware, so computers are used for storing data, displaying graphics and processing data. And finally, you have the computer software. So that's where you get your variation between your ArcGISs or your QGISs. And I think there's one more, but I don't use it, so I don't know. Um, computer programs that run these, um, sorry, these softwares are the fundamental facilitator for GIS. So we're going to be talking to you about QGIS today. Some of you may have be, may be aware of that now, may not be, doesn't matter. Some of you may be aware of its rival ArcGIS. We've chosen Q because it's open source and that's what's really important because anyone can use it. And actually, Arc and Q, pretty similar. If you can do one, you can certainly do the other and you might as well be able to do the free one. So, GIS maps perform six fundamental operations. They capture data, they store data, they query data, they analyze data, they display data, and they present data. And I know that display and present seems like similar things. They're not, they're not quite. So I put them twice. Right. So I've got a really fun example for you about early applications of the combination of spatial information and other types of data. So my example, is actually from 1854 and I know that doesn't seem sensible for like a QGIS talk we're talking about computers and software and hardware no no it's really about linking the what with the where so a pioneer of epide epidemiology Dr John Snow reported locations of um he took reported locations of cholera outbreaks and he plotted them on a map um showing the streets of Soho in London it's because he was trying to identify patterns in the spread of disease that were completely ravaging this neighborhood so he was actually able to identify that higher death rates um, of cholera were surrounding public water pumps, which drew water from the Thames. So he was able to conclude that actually cholera was spread as a waterborne agent, which was actually um, 
it went against the prevailing theory, which was miasma, so airborne particles. So not that his not that his work necessarily was able to do anything about stopping the cholera outbreak, but certainly it was interesting because what he did was he linked what, in this case, the deaths from cholera with where, so in this case, the streets of Soho. So using an early geographic information system, like an early GIS, Dr. Snow was able to make really important conclusions that have you know, contributed to the eradication of cholera in this country. Um, there's a really interesting article called Something in the Water, The Mythology of Snow's Map of Cholera. Um, there's some really interesting visual aids there to look at. I definitely recommend looking it up. It's hosted on the Airstory website. So a bit of uh, background on GIS. So as we know it today, it grew out of efforts by land managers in the 1960s to construct a visually linked database that would allow them to track growth and provide a basis for planning and would allow them to isolate areas suitable for specific, specific activities on, and facilities. So think farming or town planning, that kind of uh, action it came from. So geographers and biologists then began to use GIS to conduct spatial analysis of various activities and populations. And then archaeologists were also quite early adopters of GIS, beginning to utilise the geospatial technology for projects as early as the 1980s. So the three typical applications of GIS in, sorry, I've skipped ahead. The three... Three typical applications of GIS in archaeology tend to range between analysis and visualisation, uh, data management and also the development of predictive, predictive models. So archaeological investigation often begins with systematic research or survey um, that, that creates an inventory or we look to identify the anth anthropogenic material for a particular site or region. So those of you who are terrestrial archaeologists who are diggers maybe, that's that, that's collecting information, that's the plotting your you're plotting your um, features, you're recording your finds, you're recording with a GPS stick probably, that's the collecting information. So these inventories are then used in, in part to gain insight about the overall spatial and temporal dimensions of a site based on you know, artifact, type, uh, artifact types um, and formation or distribution of features. So we start to gain a bit more information about how a site forms. And then actually the easiest way to render that is often digitally. So determining an area, so this kind of information can be used to determine further areas of interest or to uh, build understandings of patterns, which can then be used to determine where other sites might be. So determining, determining areas of interest or for areas of investigation are, it's not only important for underlying research questions, but it's also really useful for, pra for pragmatic reasons. So if we know that over here there was a load of Roman stuff, and over here there was a load of Roman stuff, and in the LIDAR we can see there's a big road running along, could be some Roman stuff here as well. And all of that you can identify spatially and digitally. So very useful for my, like a financial and pragmatic purposes. So GIS and archaeology allows archaeologists to access, analyse, interpret large amounts of archaeological data very quickly and very efficiently. Um, also, as a little tag on here, from an employability perspective, um, when I was writing this presentation uh, a couple of weeks ago, on the 4th of April, I had a look at the CIFA Jobs Bulletin and also the British Archaeological Jobs Resource. And there were 34 jobs listed on that day between those two uh, items. And 20% of them listed GIS competence as a desirable or uh, essential skill. So it's very marketable and very useful skill for any archaeologist to have. This weren't, these weren't all like top level jobs, these were across a range of, of different types of careers. So it's a very marketable skill. So this is one of the reasons that Ellie and I are here today because we just want to spread the love with it really because it's great and all archaeologists should be using it. So glad that you're all here. So now I'm going to whittle through some examples of archaeology and GIS. So bring it back to you guys in the room. Um, this example on the screen, you can see how GIS has been used as a visualisation and interpretation tool alongside a 3D model of, this is actually Chattel Hoyuk in Turkey, Neolithic site. So the features, features have been recorded with GPS. You can see the little green dots here, those are like finds. But you can also see specific layers have been drawn and identified on the model, so you can see these coloured shapes in the rooms. Another example here, this is my favourite one. I I was originally um, 
a marine archaeologist and I'm a big coastal archaeology fan, so this is going to be a really fun coastal archaeology example for you all. Get ready. So here's a fantastic, wonderful example of how GIS can be applied in archaeological context. So say that I am a researcher in historical uh, land loss and coastal change. I can use GIS to map the coastal change and I'll be using historical maps to identify what's been lost. So um, I don't know whether you're aware, OS has been going for a long time, that's Ordnance Survey. Their maps are really highly accurate, even the old, old ones. So this is from 1883. This is a village called Cove Heath, Cove Hive, not sure. It's in Suffolk on the East Anglian Cove Hive, thank you. The East Anglian coast. Um, interesting history. Um, about Cove Heath, it has medieval, or it um, has medieval origins and it was a bustling market town, a port town in its day. So coastal erosion further north and shifting rivers, which is quite common on the East Anglian coast um, and things like um, longshore drift have caused um, sediment accretion to actually remove the river in this area. So what was a port town became just a cliff town because there was no more river. So that's not the interesting thing today, but Cove Heath you need to know now is now just a sleepy town on a beautiful picturesque part of the Suffolk coast. Here it is today. So these images weren't perfectly lined up, but you can see that it seems to be a lot smaller than it was. But now I actually uh, will line them up perfectly. So using the field boundaries and the previous roads that you can see in the map, 569 meters of coast has been lost between 2023 and 1883. It's terrifying, it's absolutely terrifying. I mean, I hope none of you live in East Anglia because you'll be underwater in like 10 years time. Terrifying, but this is a really fantastic application of um, GIS and spatial, spatial management of data to identify what's been lost. I mean, there's a Coast Guard station here. I mean, for those of you who are interested in coastal archaeology, apparently there was a lot of Roman activity on the coast of East Anglia and there's still evidence of it today. Think about how much Roman activity there's probably underwater now, considering this is only a couple of hundred, you know, 150 years. Think about how much is beyond that. It's very cool, very interesting. I could and might talk about it forever. So another really good example of um, application of GIS in archaeological context. So here you can see the viewshed or the zone of theoretical visibility of um, some, some, oh, nope, some data. So this image shows an area of Dartmoor. The red points represent barrels and burial monuments. And the base map is coloured in grayscale. So I don't know how well you can see with the light, but I suppose you can see things like ridges and things like valleys, if that's nice and visible. So um, the areas that are what we've done here is essentially run a visibility model, essentially. So we were trying to identify the, the, how visible uh, barrows were from each other. So areas that are white are particularly highly visible from other areas in the landscape and areas that are dark are highly invisible. So take about what you will, but you can see the barrows placed along the western ridgeline are typically less visible than other barrows. I mean, I'm not a Bronze Age barrel, uh, barrow expert, but certainly there's some interesting conclusions that can be drawn from barrow placement. So it's not a perfect art, but mapping zones of the theoretical visibility can contribute to setting studies and desk-based assessments. So creating a viewshed requires the use of a digital surface elevation or digital terrain model. Um, so that's like a DSM, a DEM or a DTM. Don't worry, blank faces, it's fine. These will make sense soon. Um, the key feature of these data types is actually that they contain um, elevation data. So ups and downs, not just lefts and rights. So um, a good free source of this data can be found on the Ordnance Survey website. There's OS50 you can download. It's pretty decent resolution. Or if you've got a couple of hours on hand, you can download a lot of LiDAR tiles from the DEFRA website totally for free. So once you've got your surface, you can set viewpoints and their viewing height. So for example, the height of a person, apparently, according to QGIS, is 1.6 metres. Um, but then also, once you've decided how tall your person is going to be and where they're standing, you can decide how long, how far away they can see. So an um, interesting piece of information, if you're standing on the edge of a cliff looking out to sea on a clear day, the horizon is supposed to be 4.8 kilometres from where you're standing, theoretically. The higher you go up, the further you can see. It's sort of a matter of relevance there, but that's the principle that it uses. It says, right, how, how far can I realistically see? Where am I standing and what's in the way? And then you can map what you can and can't see. So here's a really well uh, put together example of um, <laughs> spatial, of uh, 
the viewshed. So um, I didn't do this just sitting outside of the conference at 10 o'clock this morning as an extra bit of slide stuff, but you can see from the artwork here, it's really well put together. So for example, you're doing a heritage impact assessment for wind farm development in the Peak District. You might want to test whether the wind farm is going to affect how this grade two listed tower um, is going to be perceived, which might affect its setting. So based on this terrain, the location of the listed building and the wind farm planned location in this example, the wind farm is actually going to be very visible in the backdrop of the uh, listed building. So that could significantly impact its setting. And being able to demonstrate this, not just by going to site and standing there and actually looking at it, being able to demonstrate this is a really good way to talk to clients about why they can't necessarily put a whopping great wind farm wherever the hell they want to. So and, um, another, another fantastic example here is that LIDAR terrain data has been used to create a profile of land across the site. So you can see at the bottom here, the land goes up and down and it's um, not just looking at a 2D flat example of where a site is, you can actually start to appreciate its topography as well. So now I'm going to talk to you about some GIS data fundamentals. And this is the kind of thing that I'm not expecting everybody to completely understand right now. Those of you who have had GIS dabbles or recognize a lot of these words. Those of you who haven't, don't worry, it's, it's actually not as hard as it sounds. So geographical data comes in a variety of forms and they're produced by different methods, often by different people and frequently to very different standards. As such, it's really important that you know as much, about, uh, as, much as possible about the data you're going to use. So for example, um, in the marine sector, it's really important that you pay attention to coordinate systems and datums because in sometimes, um, you'll find that people will use different projection systems depending on where you are in the UK. You might not use the same projection system you do on land as you do in the sea. And then again, if you go abroad, it's a whole different matter, whole different set of projections. So I'm going to whittle it down to the most important pieces of information that you need to know about now, which is vector data and raster data, which plays probably the, the, the most two, two most important parts of building GIS maps and understanding uh, the kind of digital information that you want to be understanding as archaeologists. So in order for us to make sense of the data sets from multiple sources, we've got to know as much as we can about them. So the next slides, we're going to go over um, some really key fundamentals of GIS data so that you can understand the lingo that goes with it. So GIS information contains at minimum two different types of information, location and attributes. So location naturally describes where an object is on the surface of the world, and that can come in the form of um, X and Y, east and northern, lat long, so your typical coordinates. Um, the next thing is attributes, and these describe mostly non-locational information. So for example, somebody's name, or the type of item that we're describing, or its size maybe, or just description. So there are two key forms of data used in GIS, and these are vector and raster data. Vector data is stored as points, lines, and polygons. Vector data can also store attributes, and these are the points you see here. So these are just pieces of point data. They've got a position, and they'll have attribute data behind them. I'll, use, I'll show you an example of that in a bit. Um, raster data is represented by pixels with values that create a grid. So for example, that's your satellite imagery, your multi-beam data, your LiDAR data. Um, in raster data, the spatial representation of an object and its related non-spatial attribute are merged into a unified data file. Don't worry, I don't really know what that means either. Um, on the left, you can see vector data, which represents a series of data points showing the location of shipwrecks in the North Sea. And on the right is uh, LiDAR data over Stonehenge. So you can see the burrows, cursus, and if you look bottom right, you can see the henge itself. So vector data. We're back in Coveath now. So vector data is comprised of geometry and attributes. So geographic objects can be represented such as a point, a line, or a polygon, which is just any shape, um, all of which are vector files. An easy, so an easy way to define it is um, the spatial locations of features are defined on the basis of coordinate pairs. So you've got um, like a point is an object representing one single coordinate pair, so one X and one Y. A line is a sequence of two or more points that are connected. So you've got two coordinate pairs there, two or more, depends on how many aspects of a line you've got. And your polygon is one or more lines starting and ending with coordinates the same. So a square will have one, two, three, four sets of coordinates. Easy. Vector objects contain attributes which provide information associated with a feature. An attribute table consists of information about the, about the specific set of geographic features, usually arranged so that each row represents a feature and each column represents one feature attribute. So here you can see um, 
The point here highlighted in red is the Church of St Andrew, which will probably be in the sea in about 25 years. Um, you can see that it's list entry. This is a, a listed building data set, by the way. You can see that it's grade one listed. You can see when it was listed and you can see it's easting and northern at the bottom. And also cheekily, there's a hyperlink there so you can learn more about it if you wish. So in this example, I've just basically just clicked on this data set and it's just popped up with the information I want, which is very convenient. So raster data is comprised of grid cells, as I said. Each cell contains a value for a particular phenomenon of an observation. So for example, pixels in a satellite image or side scan data or bathymetric data can represent things like elevation or depth. So in the case on the screen, you're looking off the coast of Kothith and you can see the bathymetric uh, gradation of the seabed, essentially. So most raster data you'll use will include things like scanned maps or satellite imagery or photography, um, side scan sonar or multi-beam data if you're working um, offshore, although to be fair, you can have similar data working on land. Um, the people at Magnitude Survey will know all about that. So the people in red outside the store. So important information that's stored in a raster file is your grid size, grid resolution and georeferencing information. Georeferencing is key because that's what attaches uh, a piece of um, raster data to where it belongs on the map. You can have raster data that isn't attached geographically to anything, but then what use would that be? So in this example, you can see some bathymetric data that's been symbolized so that blue is shallow and red is deep. And I just clicked on one of the points on the zone here and you can see that actually it's uh, 12 meters deep in this example. You can't see where I've clicked, but it's in the red bit. So GIS programs can use raster data to create derived raster data sets. So for example, you can calculate the slope or an aspect of the terrain, uh, terrain raster. So um, the example I showed you earlier of the, uh, I'll just show you the example I showed you earlier here. This has been generated in GIS. So, um, the core characteristics of GIS data, um, as we've said, as I've said before, is describing and recording spatial data. So in order to do this, you need to have a basic understanding of coordinate systems. So this is the boring bit that I said I'm going to expect some glazed faces. Stick with me, guys. Just stick with me. So there are a number of ways to express uh, a location. So here you can see six different ways of describing the location at the CIFA conference at the Crown Plaza Hotel in Nottingham, where we are now. So all of these expressions are related to some form of positioning system and they provide spatial information. So you can convert each of these expressions into the other. For example, you can turn a postcode into coordinate expressed as degrees, minutes, seconds. You can convert um, a grid reference into what three words, which for those who don't know, it's this fantastic program where you can every single meter square on the planet has been given three unique words. So you can, you can say I'm in we're in olive spill living if you're in a meter square that's at the bottom of the stairs in the, in the foyer down there, for example. Um, Mongolia actually started using that as their postal code system recently, or they trialed it. So interesting way of um, accessing spatial information there. So the key expressions of spatial data that we use in JS tend to be latitude and longitude and easting and northing. So I'm going to run through some basic coordinate systems and how they relate to map projections. So a lot of you will have heard of latitude and longitude. Not all of you will know precisely what those things mean and where they came about. Don't worry, don't worry, it's fine. So the lines of latitude are the, par are the parallels and longitudes are the meridians. And they're based on a 360 degree division of the earth where each degree is divided into 60 minutes and each minute into 60 seconds. So this 360 degree system for dividing a sphere was developed by the Sumerians in the third century BC. Uh, latitude lines are parallel lines that run east and west around the Earth's surface. Yes, that is right. Um, they, right. They're north and south of the equator, and the latitude line that is equidistant from the geographic north and south, south, south poles is called the equator. Longitude lines run north-south around the Earth's surface and intersect at the poles. They measure the distance to the east and west of the prime meridian. The prime meridian runs through a determined location, which is actually Greenwich, uh, the UK, which is stated as this, that's the zero reference line. So that's um, partly on which we base things like uh, time difference, for example. So measurements for latitude and longitude can be expressed in degrees, minutes and seconds, or they can also be converted into decimal degrees. So decimal degrees are the equivalent of the measurements in degrees, minutes, seconds, but 
they're converted into decimal because it makes computer calculations run quicker and more efficiently. Um, the one that we're going to be talking about mostly today is British National Grid. So the Ordnance Survey uh, National Grid System, which is also known as British National Grid, is a system of geographic grid references using Great Britain, which is uh, distinct from latitude and longitude. So the system was developed solely for Great Britain and is based on a military system developed after the Jacobite Rebellion in the UK in 1745. So the British Army realised that it didn't have a good enough map of the Scottish Highlands, which made rounding up the remaining Jacobite loyalists very hard. So they developed this grid system of Scotland. And the Ordnance Survey, as we know it today, for those of you who are keen walkers, you probably heard of OS maps, you probably have OS maps. Um, that developed out of that system and it's still the principal source of maps of the UK today. So this grid system uses a combination of letters and numbers to demarcate specific places. Um, the measurements can also be expressed in eastings east and northings or in degrees and you can convert them to and from these different expression types. But don't worry, you can't do these things in your head. You have to use dedicated converter. I'm not suggesting anyone should be doing this, doing this kind of maths in your brain. Um, cool picture for you now. So just to check, there are no flat earthers in this room. No, fantastic. So sometimes, sometime around 500 BC, uh, the Greek philosopher Pythagoras pr proposed that the earth was round. And later it was proven by Aristotle, although this fact wasn't really widely accepted until the medieval period. And believe it or not, despite practical demonstrations by Portuguese and Spanish sailors in the early 16th century, and the first pictures from space in 1946, spherical earth theory is actually still in question today. Bizarre, I know. So the fact that the Earth isn't flat creates quite a bit of a problem for mapping it. So to demonstrate, consider the Earth to be an orange. You can't peel the skin of an orange off the orange and make it lie flat without distorting it in some way. So how can we solve this? So in order for 3D coordinate systems, such as the lat-long system, which is based on a sphere, um, to work on a 2D map, it must be transformed or projected, is what it's called in this situation. So coordinates on the globe are transformed to XY values on a projected map. So if two projections are based on different coordinate systems, each projection will produce a different physical location for the same set of coordinates. So it's really important that you understand the difference between the coordinate systems that you're going to use and the projections you're going to use. Um, GIS applications have a really good way of solving this because they have built-in projections. So you don't always necessarily need to know exactly what you need. QGIS is quite clever. It will just tell you what it thinks is best in some situations. So you must be really careful to select the appropriate projection system otherwise known as a coordinate reference system, um, in order to make sure that you're using your data properly and effectively and accurately. So to further demonstrate this issue, um, here is the Mercator map. So this is the most commonly used map in the world. It classes the walls of geography classrooms. And if anyone who's got Apple or Google Maps on your phone, this is what you're seeing, probably less colorful. Um, it shows latitude and longitude as nice, straight, flat lines, and the shape of countries is quite well defined as well. And also it's rectangular, so it can be printed really easily. However, it is fundamentally flawed. The relative sizes of countries is totally out of whack. And I'm going to show you why now. So North America in the map there seems much larger than Africa. Not right. Africa is actually 1.23 times the size of North America. And if you tessellate really cleverly, you can fit the USA, India, Europe, and China into Africa. And if you're really good at shapes, you can cram Liberia and Japan in there as well. So this, while this is our general accepted view of what the Earth looks like, totally wrong. Another example is Greenland. This also seems to rival Africa in the Mercator map. Greenland in the red there, Africa down the bottom. Totally wrong. This is the size difference between these two countries absolutely crazy. So the Mercator distortion issue is sometimes referred to as the Greenland problem because this is one of the biggest uh, issues in terms of distortion. Um, so because of these issues, we must use projections to make sure that what we are looking at is correctly measured, um, making sure that we're creating accurate models and all of our analysis is actually based in fact. So there's loads of different ways you can project the Earth. But today, as I said, we're going to be using British National Grid. So for those of you working in terrestrial archaeology in the UK, this is the one you need to worry about. So I've run you through what the, uh, what the British National Grid was in its origin. So this is essentially the projection that should be used when dealing with specific National Grid coordinates. So this is slightly different from lat long, but you can convert. Um, essentially, think about this projection as if the globe were folded out onto a piece of paper. And as we know, that piece of paper isn't flat. So what 
um, British National Grid has done is taken that piece of paper, cut out the bit around the UK and ironed it flat. And that result is what you see here, the British National Grid. This is why British National Grid can't be used anywhere else in the world, because those bits haven't been ironed yet. So different countries will have their own specific ways of describing locations and coordinates in their country, although most of Europe just uses really normal lat long because they're sensible. We have to do something funky and different, but that's Britain for you. So this is the one that we're going to be dealing with today. Um, for those of you who do work abroad, there's lots of fantastic guides on the QGIS website about how to find the most appropriate coordinate system you're looking at. So other projections include um, WJC84, which you may, come, you may come across. This one is um, really useful if you're working in the marine zone or often if you're working abroad. WJC84 is the one people tend to use. Um, it was, it's a basically, it's a, georef it's a reference system used by GPS. So in your car, on your phone, GPS system uses WJC84 as a projection in order to make sure it's locating you most appropriately or locating the GPS I thing most appropriately. And its location is actually the Earth's centre of mass. And it's, um, this uses like, it's, it's, it's a triangulation based programme and then it's projected using W284 which is spherical. Um, it was actually started to be used in the beginning of the 19th century as a kind of early mapping system. And then the latest, the, the most recent and most common version was released in 1984, hence why it's called uh, uh, WGS84. Um, another one you might want to know about is Universal Transverse Mercator System, which, as we know from our maps, isn't fantastic because it stretches everything out and it distorts all the countries. Um, and this essentially divides the whole Earth into 60 different zones and north and south. So it keeps a, it keeps a constant distance between each of those uh, zones and means that say you're working in, I don't know, zone 1, S, which is the bottom left corner, it means that everything in that particular strip, that's been ironed, like British National Grid has. So as long as you're working in specifically that zone, you're safe, you just can't do anything else beyond those without messing up somewhere. So I've run you through a really basic introduction. Don't worry if you don't remember all of this. We've provided it as a kind of framework for learning and a bit of a basis. Um, and also it will be available um, via the CIFA website swiftly, it's being recorded. Um, so Ellie's gonna take you now through some of the basics of setting up a project and the key tools you need to get going with uh, QGIS. So the idea is, is that you'll get a feel for using the software and then you can have the handy workbook that we've created, which um, will be available via QR code at the end of the session. And then you can go off and practice your newfound skills. So